Welcome everyone to the JB Media Digital Drop-In. My name is Sarah Benoit. I'm the lead instructor and co-founder of the JB Media Institute. And I'm here today as usual with my co-founder and other instructor, Justin Bellamy. So I'm really excited today to talk about this topic simply because I feel like there are so many different emerging technologies right now when it comes to virtual events and how we produce them, how we market them. And I think going forward, we're not even 100% sure if we have everything, we kind of have a full view of where everything is going. So I think as we go into 2021, we're going to see a lot of exciting things in this you know, world of event production uh, that's just evolving. I think we're gonna see new technologies, new ideas, really innovative experiences coming together. So I'm excited to talk about that today. Just a quick reminder for everyone, we are recording this webinar. You will receive a copy of my slide deck as well as Justin's in addition to the recording by tomorrow. So you don't have to remember everything. Um, in addition, as we go through, we will take questions. We should hopefully have time at the end as well. But if you have questions, I would love it if you could enter it into the question and answer feature, the Q&A. That just makes it a little easier for us to track than the chat. But of course, I'll be monitoring both. So I will definitely try to keep an eye on the chat as well. So first, I want to open up today by talking about a few different trends. And again, because all of this information is kind of emerging, I did a lot of research over the last couple of weeks to try and just kind of, you know, see what the data says. But I think a lot of what at least I'm sharing in today's webinar is certainly a mixture of what I see the experts saying, what the studies are showing, but really what I'm hearing and seeing on the ground as someone who is doing a variety of different events. So not only at the Institute are we producing our own events, but then I'm participating in a ton of other events that are happening virtually around the country. So uh, again, you're gonna get a mixture of observations and links and data and studies that you can click on. But just to know, a lot of this is again emerging. So I expect that by the time we get to the beginning of the new year, we're gonna have a number of other studies and pieces of data to pour over. But the first trend I've been seeing is the virtual world, although this is kind of sad for a lot of us because in-person events have a certain kind of power and a special kind of feeling that it's hard to recreate in the virtual world, there are amazing opportunities that are happening to smaller events, especially those that are held in more rural areas. So the virtual world has now opened up the opportunity for many events to make national and international contacts, not just with speakers and performers, but with the attendees themselves. So we are seeing this really interesting shift. I was out in Tryon, North Carolina, and I was talking to the film festival there. And one of the things they were really excited about was this opportunity to bring more national and international people into their film festival because it no longer required figuring out how to get to rural North Carolina, right? So that's a big opportunity. Speakers, experts, and leaders that are in um, your sphere, they might be willing to join you for virtual events because of how much simpler it is. I also think as a speaker myself, there's some adjusted pricing at the cost of getting different people to uh, speak and be a part of your event. So to me, that's an awesome opportunity again, because if I don't have to pay for flights and a place to stay and all of those things, it's gonna cut the cost of the overall just event. And then there's a lot of new opportunities for partnership because of this expansion into the national and international kind of reach that almost any event can get at this point. So I'm really excited about this trend because I'm always looking for silver linings. Um, even when big things are happening and changing, we have to adapt. I wanna see what opportunities we have. To me, this was a really big, exciting part of the opportunity for a lot of smaller events this year. 
Also, when it comes to just growth, um, right now there's been a little bit of research around virtual events. And because of just the explosion in 2020 and how that explosion of virtual events has really affected people's perspectives on how they are going to manage their events in the future, um, they're predicting right now at Grandview Research that there will be almost a tenfold growth in the virtual event sort of production world in the next 10 years. So this seems a little crazy to me. <laughs> we'll see if it pans out in the next 10 years. Um, I do have a feeling when we can all get back together, there is gonna be you know, a big kind of uh, swing of the pendulum for a while where we all get in person. But I think, like I said, what they're seeing with growth is that a lot of people are looking at how the virtual and the in-person stuff can really come together. So that's the third trend I'm really excited about, which is in-person and virtual events. This hybrid idea really is becoming increasingly interesting to people. So this has already existed. We've already been doing this, right? You can run an event, live stream it, sell it to people who can only attend virtually or digitally, as well as people who can come in person. But a very small percentage of events were actually operating that way especially medium to small size events, you typically didn't have the manpower and the resources to manage all of that. But as the tools get easier and as just we streamline a lot of this virtual and online participation and engagement kind of tools, as we streamline those together, I think what we're gonna find is going forward, even as we begin to open up events to in-person attendees again, we're going to keep that virtual piece in place because it is a place where we can generate revenue. So another study was showing 76% of event planners are saying that they're going virtual and that you know they've already gone that direction this year, but they're going to keep going in that direction because they see, like I said, some of these fresh opportunities and new things that they can do. The other thing that's really a big trend is single integrated platforms. So I have been playing around with a lot of different platforms. I know Justin and his team have done in-depth research on a lot of this, which uh, you know he can probably answer some questions down the road as well if you have any thoughts or, or want any feedback on different platforms. But I've really seen that we quickly in 2020 had to move towards businesses, especially businesses that produce multiple events or events that are more complex, right, and have concurrent sessions and want a lot, like a higher level of interactivity. They really need to have kind of one main technology vendor. Um, a lot of us in the beginning of 2020 just started throwing tools together and making up our own toolkit, and that's awesome. I'm still using that approach right now. But I do think there's a lot of amazing new vendors out there with new features, and they really are streamlining. There are a lot of uh, new event kind of production softwares out there now that are allowing you to connect into your Zoom, connect into your Facebook Live, connect into your YouTube. So you have one kind of main platform where you get to manage everything from. Also, we see a lot of these platforms have grown to have dedicated support staff. They're really trying to help people execute a wide variety of events. So you may have some small and some large. Um, you know, some of this is saving organizations money uh, because they're able to integrate it more into all one kind of uh, tool set that they're using. Um, a lot of these systems also, if they're more advanced for conferences and larger events, they're going to have event data and they're going to capture information about your attendees and they're going to allow you to do some types of things like email marketing and like I said, social media integration and things like that. And Trey, I see your question in here. Can you share some pluses and deltas from your recent SOCAP experience in terms of engagement? So I'm gonna hold that question just because I think that's gonna be a great thing for Justin to look at when he hops into uh, the second half of today. But again, I just want us all to be aware that the technology is continuously changing, right? It's kind of, it's, it's literally, I think, emerging uh, evolving as we speak. So that's what gets me excited about the new options that are out there. So be aware that I think as you're producing more events and working on events, it's going to be important to pay attention to what's going on with these different systems. And then I think we're going to continue to see augmented reality and virtual reality accelerate. So another part of the technology that is really trending, moving fast. Again, we already had an excellent 
kind of movement in this world. This is something I've been excited about. The development of VR especially gets me really excited as an educator. Um, and I just think 2020, there has been a lot of incentive to move forward with these technologies, which is really exciting. So, you know, this is where we're gonna see AR and VR really are transformative when it comes to virtual events, because I think it's gonna create a much more immersive experience. I think attendees are gonna be able to connect at a much deeper level, have way more interactivity and sort of more personalized experiences. Um, and again, I think the reason why AR and VR are something people are investing in, really looking at right now, what are the possibilities? How can we get it out to more people? How can we make it more accessible and affordable? I think it's because there are some people in the event production world that are realizing there are perks of you know, being in person and having this experience. And VR especially has the potential to give you some of those same perks, but without the traditional expenses of in-person. Although we will be spending money on the AR and VR. So, <laughs> you know, we'll see how that all kind of balances out in the end as far as cost is concerned. So my five main observations as I've been working on events, um, going from what I just said to now, event software, big deal, growing, changing, evolving, developing as we speak, and the options are really endless. So for me, what I'm really focusing on is I'm looking at new technology and looking at new options and consulting with clients that are looking at those options as well. One thing I'm doing is keeping it simple. Right. I'm really trying to work on not overcomplicating what can, we can do. Trends are great, but we want to be careful sometimes we don't jump into the trendiness and make the system that we're asking people to use uh, too confusing for them. So I'm always checking myself on simplicity. I'm talking to a lot of audiences, listening to them, trying to understand what it is that they really want right now. Um, do they want shorter or longer sessions? Do they want certain levels of interactivity? I'm really asking them what would be helpful. Also with event software, I really wanna make sure I have good support, especially because some of these systems are more expensive. And if you're gonna pay a higher premium, I think you really wanna know when are they making updates to the system? You know, what are the different features compared to the different pricing packages? And can they show you some demos of how the system is gonna work, whether somebody's using a phone, a tablet, a computer, whether they're using a browser or they're gonna to have to download a special app. There's pros and cons to a lot of that different stuff. So make sure you're asking the right questions and do some research before you decide. A few examples of event systems that I've been talking about with our consulting clients here at the Institute um, are these four, Crowdcast, Excel Events, Blue Jean Events, and GoToTraining. GoToTraining is actually an arm of the GoToMeeting suite of tools. So all of these systems, I think, have pros and cons. I wish we had longer today, but in you know 50 minutes, we can't cover all of that. But I definitely suggest you check them out. And I think, like I said, the biggest thing to think about is compare the prices, get demos and see what you really think about it. You know, Read the reviews from other people, go online and do some research, and really make sure you choose a tool that you're going to feel comfortable with and build in time for a learning curve. If your event is next month, understand it's going to be really hard to put together a piece of software like this and really feel confident about it if you're brand new. So again, if you pay a higher premium for a tool, make sure they've got support, they'll train you, um, and you can be you know ready out of the gate to run your event if you're working on a very short timeline. The other thing I'm seeing is diversify your video content. So the comparison between live events with live content versus on-demand content that people can watch at their leisure based on their own schedule. Again, there's many pros and cons to live versus on-demand. And I think what we see is that a lot of events now are combining these things, right? So we are coming up with a lot of different ways for people to interact and a lot of different types of content, uh, depending again on how much prep time we have for the event. We're really looking at ways that we can engage people and really meet them where they are with their needs. So, you know, pre-recorded video is great, but we want to keep it shorter. We want to keep it digestible. Um, live sections. Uh, to me, live sessions can be increasingly interactive, right? Do polls, do breakout sessions, do different things where people can actually connect with each other. Um, give people a chance to network, 
Think about how you can bring in your third party live streaming tools if you're already using them. Um, and again, think about creative ways with pre-recorded content. Can you release it at specific times? Uh, do they have a limited amount of time to watch? Sometimes that can incentivize the engagement. So, you know, don't kind of get stuck on one way of thinking because as we all move forward, we listen to our past attendees or our future attendees. We really sometimes can find out what it is that they need and it might be a combination of these things. Also post event recordings. So if you're gonna record your live content, what do you do with it afterwards? This is something we talk about in our JB Media Institute meetings all the time. I still haven't found the perfect way to create my recorded content to the point where I feel like I can sell it afterwards. We're still really looking at how we can do that. But I think there's a lot to discuss there, right? So are free recordings part of the attendees ticket price? Um, can we sell that content to people who weren't there live for a you know, lower price for them to be able to just watch it? Um, can we include expert panels or interviews? Can we bring bigger names into the conversation? And then that way, again, create some pre-recorded content um, or recorded content we can share afterwards, after the live event, and really, again, create a way to generate more revenue. Um, can we edit these things down into event promos? Or can we create some sort of limited time access versus lifetime access for different attendees? So again, this depends on the size of your event, the kind of event, how you've done things in the past. Um, but I think that's where, you know, you really want to think about those opportunities as you're going forward. The fourth thing is live interaction. So really, whatever you can do to keep things exciting, to keep people really engaged with what you're doing, I would do that. I love the style of webinar we're doing today when we do just an hour. I think it's fast, it's easy, it allows all of you to do things while you're in your day. It allows me to feel sort of laid back and able to not have to manage a lot of people on the screen. But when I do longer events and other types of events, I really prefer the meeting style where we can do breakouts, where we can see each other. I think that creates a level of connection again that is stronger. So really think about that. And again, if you're gonna have sponsors, if you're gonna have round tables, if you're gonna have these other types of breakouts that we used to do in person, how can you create that space in your event? So I recently went to WordCamp Asheville in September. And I loved that I had a virtual booth and people could come and talk to me if they wanted. I still think we're trying to get people used to that way of navigating things, but it was really helpful to have that private space to invite people after I did the panel that I was part of to invite them to come and talk to me. So really figure out ways that you can make people feel like they're connected to the rest of the folks that are attending. And then offer pricing tiers. This is something, again, I'll give a shout out to Justin about. I think he always has really awesome ideas about how we can do this with our particular offerings, whether they're small one-off classes or larger two or three day events. And I think it's really, again, important to just think about what are the options that you can give people? What are you hearing that they need? So are early bird discounts something you can offer? Can you bundle different types of things together, like access to the recordings afterwards, plus the live sessions, plus a private <laughs> round table with a certain expert? How can we put these sort of bundled packages together and have tiered pricing? Is there a difference for the live versus the on-demand content? Are there any special access upgrades we can give people or bonus content that we can offer them? So think about how you can really, like I said, connect into creative ways to actually connect with folks and actually invite them to participate in the event. I think, you know, we've always had different styles of tickets, even for in-person events, VIP versus regular, things like that. We're really thinking about now how we can transform that into something that works in the virtual world. So Trey, I see your question. I'm hoping you can share your thoughts about scaling and costs regarding how to start and grow live events to a reliable revenue stream for thought leaders. So again, I wanna just say that it's hard to answer that question because there's literally just to me a lot of options that you could look into um, for all of this. I mean, I certainly think if you're brand new, very small and you wanna do some live classes 
or live events that are more simplistic, right? So essentially you're going to have one group of people in the room um, and maybe you'll have some breakouts and things like that, but you're not trying to have, let's say, three concurrent sessions happening at the same time, those type of things. If you're just sort of one person producing different events, bringing in partners to help you, then I think sort of that low kind of entryway is really looking at Zoom, combining Zoom with maybe, you know, your own website and your own email list, things like that, so that you're able to keep things organized about the attendees, market to people regularly, have a plan around that. But I know for me, I really started with a lot of virtual events just with a system like Zoom. Originally, I was using Join Me, and I just already had a way for people to pay. So even if I was just going to sell a class, I, it really didn't have to be that complicated, even if it was three hours. It was three hours really with me bringing in maybe some other experts, right, taking some breaks. Um, and so I just needed a basic uh, video conferencing system like that, which is fairly affordable. And then I think from there, what you start to really look at is how do you want to advance? How do you want to scale the event? Do you want to scale it? So I think Justin will talk a little bit more about scaling, but for me, you know, and my creative original side where I do a lot of my own type of uh, classes and events, that's where I do small events. There are, you know, sometimes 10, 20 people. Um, they're very straightforward. I'm, you know, for me again, because I'm a one person deal, it makes it a lot simpler and it's easy for me to bring in other speakers, make them the co-host, things like that. Um, and I really didn't want to scale because that's all I can handle on my own. But if you're Justin's agency team and you've got a whole team of people that you're working with um, and you've got a lot of experts you want to bring in, that's where I think if you start with something simple like Zoom or GoToMeeting or any of those type of tools, then you're able to at least get the ball rolling, start generating some revenue off your live events. And then, you know, especially if you're doing thought leaders, eventually you might say, OK, we want to bring 12 thought leaders together around a topic and do a two-day event and have a bunch of different sessions. And that's where you're going to have to graduate up to one of the platforms that I shared before, where you can have a little bit more integration. You can have a little bit more, um, just like I said, flexibility to have multiple things going on at the same time or bringing sponsors into a space and things like that. So I want to go ahead and pass things over to Justin. Um, I think I'm making you a co-host, Justin, so you can take the screen from me. And just remember, Trey did leave one question in there about SOCAP, um, which SOCAP is a really great big event that Justin's worked off on over the years. He's also worked on an amazing event this year um, for the Holistic Holiday at Sea. They did the Holistic Holiday at Home. So I'm excited for him to share that with you as well. Because again, his level of events are a little bigger than mine. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of your choices really come down to the size of the event and again, the type of interactivity that you want to have. So take it away, Justin. Thanks, Sarah. Great. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and jump into my presentation because I have a lot of quite a bit of content to cover and I want to leave some, hopefully some time for Q&A. Um, but Trey, I will answer your question. And while I'm getting my slides up, um, unfortunately, we did not work on SOCAP this year uh, after March. Um, we got let go in late March and I followed the event. I talked to their former CEO last week. Um, can everyone see my screen? Looks like, yes, great. All right, I'm gonna jump in and get moving and then I can answer questions at the end. So this screenshot I used to, to start my presentation was actually a group of six UNC Asheville business students who un undertook a semester long research project for JB Media, primarily focused on learning more about virtual events, everything from free webinars and webinars to conferences, because we actually kicked them off on this project. I, you know, usually when you do a semester long project, you have to plan it in the previous semester. So I uh, felt fortunate that we had this entire group of students, half of a class um, from a friend of mine at the university, focus on event on our events business. And they we ended up canceling some of their projects that were related to in-person events 
and shifting all their em emphasis to virtual events, but they were already geared up and ready to go for a full semester. And this was their, this was one entire class that all focused on working for us on this project. So it was just, this project was just part of our research <clears throat> this year. We had the team of six UNC Asheville students. They delivered maybe a hundred pages of content to us, um, research documents, spreadsheets, actual list building for some of our event outreach, um, actual outreach to some of our potential event partners for certain certain projects, and um, a lot of deep research, which was really helpful. In parallel with that, we had two uh, core team members at JB Media Group who had a lot of experience with uh, previous in-person event marketing uh, do a, a deep dive research project and created a 30 page it's basically a over like basically a guide to virtual events that they delivered as a report to the team about the same time the students project was wrapping up um, and then we attended uh, we've continued to attend but we attended probably collectively 30 or 40 workshops this year on virtual events produced by a bunch of different partners some of them were free and some of them like the conveners.org some of their events have been low cost, like up to $100 we spent uh, on each of these trainings we've attended. We then in, in April, we volunteered uh, as sponsors to help produce a impact event out of Australia called the Starting Good Summit. And we helped them grow, we handled the marketing, we helped them grow from six uh, to 6,000 attendees this year from 4,000 last year. And then we jumped in with both feet in May and worked on a new event for my father's company, which is the business was holistic holiday at sea, which has historically been for 17 years, the 2000 up to a 2000 person conference on a cruise ship. We made them an online event with 57,000 attendees. And I'll talk a lot more about that later on toward the end. So this is a slide from one of the workshops I attended. Um, they provided really great like matrix of different platforms and what this, the strengths and weaknesses of the platforms were and deep dives into platforms. They've been doing a lot of platform walkthroughs so where you can go for an hour and just see how different platforms work and look on the back end if you're trying to decide what to, to use for an event. And that's conveners.org, great organization out of, of California, who we've been working with for a few years on the SOCAP project. So um, it, for, for a 30 minute webinar we're doing today, it was hard to condense what we've learned in like 28 hours of training and hundreds of hours of research. But so I wanted to share a couple of key takeaways uh, for uh, there's a huge difference between the best practices for delivery marketing expectations for the range of virtual events ranging from things like what we're doing right now which is a free webinar up to large conferences i'll talk in a minute about two or three large conferences one being the socap conference that we did not work on this year but they ended up producing a five-day event with 240 different sessions with 700 speakers that is an insane amount of production um actually somehow they ended up doing more production for their virtual event than they do for the live event which i believe was a was a mistake strategically um, for the whole psychology at home event which i produced which had 50 speakers 70 sessions uh, 90 videos which is still a lot of work um with more than we probably should have done but it, we felt like we had to do a lot to, to um, make it really interesting we'll talk a little bit more about that all the way down to smaller events i have friends who did, have done five and ten thousand person webinars this year bigger than what they've done before because of the demand especially earlier in the year um, but what things we've learned about webinars, up to 50% of the registration can come in the last 48 hours. So keep marketing it. Don't, don't stop marketing a couple of days beforehand, thinking your registration's done. Keep marketing it. But um, as, the, as the year has gone on, the percentage of people who actually show up to webinars has gone down. And it's gone down from in the 60s, 60%, 70% range, down to 30 to 40 recently because people are getting Zoom fatigue and they're signing up for so many webinars and a lot of times they'll sign up and then they'll decide later if they want to watch the recording or they get busy and sidetracked. So this has been true for both bigger events and smaller ones. Um, the, 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 even for paid events, I've seen the attendance drop as low as 30, 40% as well. So it's not just for these smaller free ones. Um, for larger events, this is like um, multi-day events with lots of content. I would say anything with over, maybe over 10, sessions in the event would be considered large by my by my standards um and, my, and the, for those events your marketing partnerships are your number one key to success i'll talk about a case study in a minute of ones we've we've done they can drive up to or greater than 70 percent of the registrations and ticket sales 
And in order to get that type of participation, you almost always have to have some form of profit sharing or affiliate marketing structure where they earn some percentage of any sales that they generate. Um, vir large virtual events can, can lead to huge list growth. I've worked on three events, either as a producer or affiliate this year, that had over 50,000 new email addresses added to the hosts list. One of those was the event we hosted, two were events that that events uh, marketed afterwards as affiliate marketing. Those two that we helped with actually had larger uh, lists because we're working with a, a we're, we're, we're affiliating with another brand that has a thousand partners. Our event had 53 partners. They have a thousand affiliate partners that they work with. Only about a hundred are active, but still that twice as many active and some bigger ones led to a, a pretty big number of attendees for those other events that we were part of, which some of them had over 120,000 attendees. Um, and with the right funnel and format, you can market virtual, large virtual events in as little as five days and up to 21 days. But if you're new to it, especially if it's a B2B event and you're moving from a traditional in-person event to a B2B format, you need more time. You need three months or more, sometimes more. So people have been doing these virtual events for years. They have the right team, the right technical stack. They can, uh, one of the most successful events I, I was part of this year, had a five five day marketing schedule total and it made eight hundred thousand dollars 120 thousand people participated um and there's a huge amount of profit for the people who are involved with it so to get to to trey's question for those of you who don't know <clears throat> socap was our largest client before covid uh two years ago three years ago they made up 20 percent of our total revenue from an agency which had 13 employees um, so we actually had like two, two and a half full-time people on it. It's actually a team of eight, but the total hours was equivalent to like two full-time people, uh, 3,000 or more, more billable hours for the entire year on the project. They hit a huge, their whole business, uh, I think they're between five and $10 million a year business. Uh, their, their main event was a, more than 60, more than 60% of their income for the year got shut down in California, of course, uh, COVID said everyone, but early on they knew in California that they weren't gonna be able to have an event of that size when the governor canceled events over uh, 100 people for the rest of the year early in the spring. So they went virtual, they lost a couple of major sponsors as we'll talk about in a minute. And so they had to let some of their paid staff go and some of our, and most of their vendors, including us. They did mount this virtual event, which was two weeks ago. And they ended up uh, with around, close to 4,000 attendees, which is only a little bit more than they normally have in person. Ticket prices were a fraction of what they normally charge. They normally charge 1,500 for full price. And historically, like, you know, somewhere about half that average price across all the attendees. They were charging about $250 at the end and they started at $100. So the entire um, spectrum of what people paid was 100 to 250 or 300, much less like 20% of what they would normally make. And I imagine their sponsorship revenue was a lot less, but their content production was even more. Um, they had to do a lot less, of course, with the in-person production, which is expensive, like having 13 live stages at the same time, video recordings and live streaming and all those things that they normally do. But having that many sessions happening, as many as, uh, you know, 20, 10 or 20 happening at the same time online uh, through a platform called Hopin, I imagine they had a lot of staff involved in production, managing it live and, and planning it beforehand. <clears throat> so um, in my, this sort of gets me to the one of my major findings this year. Moving big high ticket B2B events to virtual is really hard. Um, because the main reason it's hard is because it's hard to make as much money. There's a lot of people who make have entire businesses that are conference, conferences and trade shows. And those businesses have really struggled. I know of a, uh, one a friend of a friend who has three trade shows that make a hundred million dollars each. Um, they had a they had a three million dollar insurance policy that paid for their events if they didn't happen. So they actually got their money for this year. But I don't know what they're going to do next year. Expo West, seventy thousand people usually meet in person. That's probably a fifty million dollar event. It was canceled, and I'm not sure if they'll be able to do it next year. So those businesses that are built around large in person events haven't been able to move online and match the revenue. Um, it takes hundreds of staff to produce an event of that scale. And there's no way to, to match that revenue online in my experience. <clears throat> um, the reason is because it's hard to get as much money online. 
uh, for the ticket sales. It's hard to match the sponsorship and trade show booth revenue. Um, and so if, if you're charging, you know, between 10 and 30% for the tickets and between 10 and 30% from the sponsor, uh, between 30 and 60% for the sponsors, and you can't get as many of them because they don't see the, this value even at the lower price, you're going to have a much less profitable event and therefore have to let some people go. And that's what I've seen across the board with, with events and not, not only events, but all sorts of production companies with, you know, live theater and entertainment, movie theaters, all struggling for various reasons related to this phenomenon um, of making of it hard, being hard to do things online. Um, that said, on the other side of the spectrum with B2C events, it's, there's already been an established best, pra best practice for virtual events that has been, there've been huge successes in virtual, in uh, virtual events before COVID, including literally thousands of $1 million or better virtual events in the B2C space. This is the one I referenced before. This event was really just a limited release of a documentary. And what they did around it is they built some online classes and some resources and some guides. And you can either buy the, um, the film, the virtual film for $10 or the physical film for $20 or for like $60, you got all these bonus classes to learn about what you learned in the film. There was classes taught by some of the people in the documentary, um, other partners. And they, they sold, I think, 14,000 or something around that number of, of these six, $60 passes or combined total between buying the DVD, buying the DVD, buying the film virtually and these passes. These, um, they're called the Impact Kids, what they called it. When you sign up, you got to watch the film for free and then you got marketed this, this add-on and people bought it at, you know, less than about 10% of people purchased something after versus just watching it free for the three days they made it available. But I personally, I signed up to sort of follow how they did it. I watched the film and didn't buy anything else, but I was, I was in, um, I considered it, I was interested in what, what they were selling and that $60 seemed like a fair price. So it obviously got a lot of other people uh, to, to buy. Um, just checking the time real quick. Um, so my experience um, with B2C events, the consumer education is much easier to translate online than the networking and the sales, that, which is why people usually attend B2B events is to network and to, or to have a booth to sell things. It is much easier to grow your list uh, through partnerships with B2C events because most B2B businesses have really relatively small lists and they kind of hold them close to their chests. Whereas uh, B2C organizations often are more willing to do partnerships where they kind of promote each other's things and that can drive a lot of a registration. Um, it can be easier to sell additional products to people. Once you've you know, inspired them and taught them something, you can sell them your products. You can affiliate with other products and sell them things afterwards and make more money. And a lot of virtual businesses that are in this space will create a year-round membership site, which is an app you can, you can sign up for for $10 to $30 a month after the event's over to receive year-round education and content. And that can be a sustaining business model for a lot of people. Um, the guy who produced this last event, this one, he does about five events a year. And they usually have between uh, five and 20,000 paying customers an average of about $100 a person or a little less, maybe 75. But he also has a membership site with about 10,000 of all these events he does. He's gotten people into his membership site and makes almost a million dollars a year off of that as well. So he has about a five to $10 million business just off of producing virtual events for B2C online. Um, so getting into our best, best case study for this year, holds a call day at home. This is the virtual version in, in late July of the event I've been working on since 2003 when my father co-founded, which was called Holistic Holiday at Sea, which was a cruise. And um, basically, uh, we built them a virtual event in less than three months from May 5th through the end of June, end of July. It had um, 70 plus sessions. This is a couple pages from the program book. We built a, we made a PDF program book. It was about 25 pages long. And you can see on, on one day, we had bunch of on-demand content released and, and hours of, of live content. And I personally produced all of it. I produced all the on-demand content with a host who did the interviews, a friend of mine from Colorado who we hired to, to host it. 
And I personally produced all the Zoom and had Sarah help with a few sessions, had a few other people help with a few of the more high profile sessions to make sure we had a professional moderator, professional facilitator. But I was there in pretty much every single session for 45 hours over the course of, of seven days uh, as we rolled this out. And it was a success uh, by a lot of standards. It was very stressful. It was a lot of work, but we didn't have any major technical challenges and it was overall success. Um, I personally recruited 53 partners, 19 were new, 19 uh, of them were new and active, meaning that they actually sent people to the event, uh, managed 50 speakers. We had 30 on-demand sessions, which were the free content, and people could sign up just for that. And then we would promote them with, into the live content with prices starting at $70 and 79 and ending around 250. Throughout the entire process, we had two, two products, the basic and VIP. The, so the BI, both prices, the basic and the VIP basically doubled from the beginning to the end of the sales cycle. And so it started out like 70 and 130 and ended up at um, 119 and, and 249 at the end of the sales cycle. We got 57,000 registrations, uh, basically doubling the size of their marketing list, which we've been building for the last 16 years. And of those 57,000, 2.7% paid for the event. So 1,600, we were hoping for closer to 5%, which would have made it much more successful financially. And we learned a lot about why we didn't hit that number for future events. Um, I don't have time to, to go into the details right now, but it had a lot to do with simplicity of the product and simplicity of the event itself. We made it a little too complicated, so it was a little hard for people to understand. Therefore, they some of them didn't just decided not to to buy it because they didn't quite understand what they were going to get. And that was our our own design issues with the event structure. So we have a, a great case study, and I'll send it to Sarah. I'm happy to send the case study out to people and we're running out of time and I want to make sure we have a little time for Q&A. So, um, but we we had, you know, as you can see in the case study, the email list growth, 85%. Uh, we had over half a million page views on their website, client's website during the three months of the event uh, schedule, which is more than they yacht for the entire year before that. Um, so huge brand exposure new partnerships, new emails. Um, the people on the list are definitely likely to buy an in-person event in their sector if they can you know, get back to doing those again in the future. So it'll, it should have long-term value. Um, the partnerships drove a huge portion of it. This is the partner dashboard in the event management system. And uh, partners drove a total of $160,000 in sales. Um, some of the partnership tracking codes were actually internal, like Facebook ads. We had our own Facebook ad tracker inside the partnership portal. So if we pull those out, it was more like maybe 90,000 in partnership sales, which is still a large number, um, about half, a little more than half of the event's sales. And then right now we're working on a new event, which will be next April. Um, it'll be in the impact sector, focused on entrepreneurs, impact entrepreneurs. The lead partner is B Lab, who certifies B Corps. I'm currently talking to about 10 others. Three of them have confirmed and six of them are deciding in the next few weeks if they wanna be part of it. We're trying a unique revenue model. It'll be an affiliate profit sharing model for the core partners. It'll be mostly education focused for the attendees, try to break that um, B2B challenge down a little bit. Uh, there'll be free content leading up to the paid content, which will help us with registration numbers and list growth. And then they'll have three main days of three and a half hours per day of content with each day having about two hours of like the most high profile content. So if you only want to commit two hours a day for three days, that'll be the value proposition of the uh, paid event. In addition to some networking experiences, which will be built around those paid days and uh, will be optional for people who want to participate in that. So here's a, um, one, one page of our slide deck about that event. And we already have a bunch of partners signed up for that. So I'm, we're almost out of time. I can go about 10 more, probably five after the, the top of the hour. Sarah, do you want to moderate the Q&A? What you think is most important? You've been following up, maybe following along a little bit. So I see we've got some questions from the Q&A and I know we're right at the end, but I will say and answer, Angela and I have been going back and forth about a longer question that I'll stay and answer afterwards. But um, Justin, I just wanna make sure, Trey's first question was about, you know, just some follow up on the SOCAP experience. Was that included in the shift event that you talked about? Well, I mentioned SOCAP, you know, we didn't. We did not send anyone to attend the event, but I did talk to their former CEO and a few attendees after it was over. 
And what I heard was that, you know, of about 4,000 people who registered at any given time during the event, which was, it was basically like six or seven hours a day for a whole week. Um, at any given time, there was about 900 people in the event platform and 100 to 200 attending the sessions that are concurrent sessions, the most popular ones. Um, and inside those sessions, there was really high profile people in the chat talking to each other. So there was a lot of feedback that it was engaging, that there were, you could have real conversations with people that are you know, well-known in the industry, that the content was really good. Um, I think they charge way too low of a price for it, um, for averaging less than $200 a ticket uh, for how much content they produce. It just feels like, I kept t telling people that I think you're, the, the market will become whatever the industry sets it to be. So if everyone makes their events $100, $200, no one will expect to pay more than that. Um, but they're not all created equal and the amount of time it takes to put them on should be considered and factored in. Um, and so I think a lot of people are shooting themselves in the foot by undercharging, building events that are too complicated and not charging enough for them. Angela asks, are you seeing virtual events for festivals? Um, not, not too many, maybe a few. Um, I think my question with that would be, um, what, would the, what would the value proposition be for the attendee of the, of the festival? Um, I think it's a somewhat challenging to s expect a lot of people to attend something like that, but if it's creative enough, I think what would be more likely to, be, to work would be like a, li a, a live theater production. Like you normally have like a theater on the state, a theater on the green or something, doing that virtually, live streaming it. Live streaming uh, maybe a storytelling s series in the park or things like that where people can have drop in and have a unique experience learning about the local, the local stories or, or upcoming events um, in ways that maybe appeal to kids, appeal to all the different demographics that, that could probably work better, I think, than a festival format, personally. Um, um, so Jay's asking, how do we, how do we manage the, the cameras, lighting and mics? Uh, for Holistic Psychology at Home, we created like a five or six page best practices branded guide and we sent it to all the speakers and most of them followed it pretty well and created a relatively good experience. We use Zoom for everything for that one and it worked pretty well. Um, you know, there were some glitches and some bloopers that resulted from equipment issues with that event. Um, People, you know, a few where people would like, uh, you know, on the session and their their spouse was in the background, like chopping on, on a cutting board or uh, putting cleaning dishes, making a lot of noise. And that happened on both the recorded sessions and the live sessions for Holistic Holiday at Home. And it, part of it was, I think, it, it kind of came across as authentic because it was people were at home and they were trying, they were still learning a lot from these extremely hard to uh, reach people that we had brought in as speakers. But it, it, it did create some issues. Uh, we had to re record one of the. Um, recorded sessions because of the amount of background noise there was and things like that. Um, so, uh, Adrian, um, I'll, I'll, send, I'll send you that um, information about Shift when it's live. It'll probably go live in about a month, I would think, five to six, four to, four to six weeks. Um, Karen's asking about resources to get started. Um, well, I, I wrote a, a book a couple of, a e book a couple of years ago on partnerships and it's a potential place to start. Um, it's called Effective Marketing Partnerships and it's on our website. And I think if you search that topic by, in my name, you should find it online as well, Effective Marketing Partnerships. Um, but you can also just look for um, free videos on YouTube on affiliate marketing and uh, event marketing through affiliates, and you should be able to learn some of the best practices for that. So Trey's question about recordings, it kind of depends on your format. Um, question is, do you see engagement on offerings, uh, offering recordings of a live event? It depends on the format and, and what they're getting. Um, we haven't seen high engagement, but with uh, Holtz Holly at Home, what we did is we pre we recorded 28 sessions before the event started, and those became we rolled those out over three days or four days. And each day we released uh, five or six of them, five to seven of them on the website, and we did see a total of 200,000 views of all the videos, 
when you have we had 56,000 people, that's not a huge, um, you know, attendance number. The top videos had seven to 10,000 views, um, which we felt was pretty good. But it definitely dwindled as the week went on. <clears throat> um, and the number of people attending live, even though we had a, about 1600 people who had purchased the ticket, I think it was about 1000 before some people bought it at the, at the end, bought the recordings and they um, on the lifetime access to all the content. So the main, the main product for that event was lifetime access to all 90 videos. Um, but some people also bought early to get the live content as well. The live content was the bonus if, if you saw, if you signed up before the event. So with those, um, we saw, you know, only 200 people per, per session live out of a thousand. So I think a lot of people knew that they had lifetime access and just watch it when they, when they wanted to later. Um, so Beth about college admissions strategies. I would need to think about that a little bit more. Um, I've never thought through that one, one before, but um, I don't, I don't know, you know, vir virtual tours could be, could be one. Um, sporting events, but if you're trying to do like a recruitment type of event, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. I think I would need to think through that through. Uh, for free events, Anna, I, I would, I mean, I don't think you can get m much better than Zoom um, because it's the cheapest one at scale. Um, you can, I think for webinars with, how many people can you have Sarah on a webinar? as attendees on the, at the base level at $50 a month, it's like a thousand, right? I think um, it's a lot and they easily go, it's only a couple hundred bucks to have uh, 5,000 or 10,000 people. Um, so you can scale it for a reason. You can just turn that on for a couple of weeks and then go back to the base, the free level. Um, and, and Jenna, yes, I do feel like I answered Angela's question the best I could. Um, regarding festivals. Okay, Jenna says it's 100. So 100 is a good starting point. I mean, you probably have to get two to 300 people to register to actually have 100 show up. And that's for $55 a month um, for Zoom. Uh, I don't think there's a better, easier to use platform that's less expensive than that at that level. So yeah, I mean, with, with a couple hundred people, you know, you could spend 150 bucks for the month and then turn, you know, you can go all the way back to the $19 or even the free version of Zoom when you don't need it anymore. Um, all right, great. And I can see we've had a lot of people that have to wrap up today, but I wanted to just go over a couple extra questions um, really, really quickly, if that's all right. And I apologize for the technical difficulties, Justin. I can't hear you at all. So I'm having to kind of jump in as we go along. Um, first, Angela, I just wanted to uh, make note of the fact we were chatting back and forth a little bit about the events that you're working on and what's involved in them. And so I really just wanted to encourage you, like I said, on a couple levels. One, I think that... Um, you know, essentially, first of all, live content to me is always easier. So anytime that you're going to produce an event, if you just live stream it, you bring all the different people involved into one platform like Zoom or GoToMeeting or something of that nature, it's just going to be easier. Pre-recorded content requires a lot of prep, editing, uploading, making a place where people can watch those pre-recorded videos. So I feel like the live content allows people to just show up and have the experience. So I'm always going to suggest that that's first. I also think a lot of live content can be done with a laptop or even a tablet and a good headset. So, you know, you want to make sure your lighting is okay, but you don't necessarily need to do professional lighting to make those things look great. And if you're bringing in other partners and speakers, I think it's a matter of doing some really good tests 
dance runs with them to make sure that their lighting, their space, their internet, their headset and everything is working well. So I think if you're going to start out with a small type of event, that's what you can do is do it live. Now, if you're trying to have performances and things like that, musicians, dancers, any type of people where movement is involved or you're going to need a camera set back in order to capture the scene, you just want to make sure, again, that you get together with those people so that they have the correct setup and they know how to do it. Many people, of course, can use any number of devices, um, get tripods for their phones or their cameras, do different things. Even my laptop, I move around quite a bit to get better shots of different things. And then I just have to make sure, again, that the audio is decent, the lighting's decent. But especially for smaller festivals and events, I don't think you need to worry about having professional videography. People just have to really be able to hear it. That's a key thing. Um, the visuals can be you know, a little less professional. And I think with smaller events, a lot of people can, they expect that to a certain extent, but they want clear audio that sounds great. So I think that's a really important part of it. When it comes to marketing, I think you're not gonna deviate from the marketing tools that you're already using. So if you're using Facebook, if you're using your website, if you're using your email newsletter, you're going to incorporate all of those things into the marketing of the event. Um, if you're doing social media advertising, you might do that. Some of you may have noticed on Facebook event pages now, you can have a completely virtual event. Um, it literally says, you know, is this virtual? Is it going to be a live stream on Facebook? What is it? So they're trying to help you create more promotional options on Facebook for promoting things that are going to happen in the virtual space and not in person. So I don't necessarily think you want to, you know, launch off onto marketing tools that are completely separate from what you're usually using. And that to me is just for small events, like Justin said, usually have core supporters, core followers, people who've been to the event before or people who just love what you're doing and want to support it. And, you know, we really want to connect with those people in the channels that they are already existing and already interacting. Um, so I know you were talking about kind of a festival that would take place in downtown with indoor and outdoor venues. I do think outdoor venues are going to cause you to think a little bit different about the technology. So again, audio is going to be key if you're outdoors and there can be background noise and things like that. So that to me is kind of a bigger leap than doing an indoor setting where you've got different people in different indoor settings and they're able to interact than when I'm trying to take the camera out into the world and actually record things there because it's more unpredictable and so audio becomes even more important there and I think when it comes to engagement it's really about giving yourself the time to market and getting people really excited about engaging online I know a lot of people have some fatigue right now around all the virtual events that we're doing so you have to kind of tap into the values and the reason why they would want to support you to get them really excited about being part of it and earlier i know beth was here and we were talking about um essentially using this type of thing to do recruitment events for colleges and universities and i just want to say you know i definitely think engaging younger people um especially with different social media tools in advance, giving them little, you know, inside snippets of what they might be able to experience um, down the road and things like that can be really valuable. And I know Beth has already had to leave, um, but yeah, I want to uh, just make sure that she has that in the recording. And Justin, did you want to jump in and talk about Jay's question? Yeah, that'll be the last one. I got to run um, before my next meeting, but to answer Jay's question about YouTube Live, as a platform, there's actually a lot of benefits to YouTube Live, but there's also some some disadvantages of it. It can be really effective, but because it has almost basically an unlimited audience, you don't, you don't have to pay much for, of anything for it. I don't think. I think it's completely free. Um, the main downside of it is it's very hard to gate it between behind like a registration or if you're trying to collect email addresses, it's much harder to to do that through it. Um, there's no registration system. A lot of what I've seen people do effectively is when they like free, free um, podcast or radio show style content that they do the same time every week or every day on YouTube live. And they often will use Zoom uh, to set up the call with the other person using a basic pro Zoom account, like $19 a month, and then simulcast that to, to YouTube. And then all their marketing says, go watch it on YouTube. So it's actually it's just a one-on-one -on -one meeting or a panel discussion on uh, just a private Zoom account. Um, but the, 
the audience is on YouTube and you have to have two laptops usually to do that. So you're answering the questions on one laptop while you're uh, hosting the session on the other laptop or you have someone in your team who's answering the questions on, on YouTube. Uh, I have one, one of my mentors in this space does that and she actually simulcasts on Facebook Live, YouTube at the same time and one other platform through the same streaming system, streaming a, a Zoom meeting where she's, and she's done, uh, she's approaching 365 days in a row where she's done at least one, at least one, sometimes two a day uh, interviews on Zoom on, and their YouTube audience is 100,000 100, subscribers, but about very between 300 and 1,000 watch each episode. I've been on her show three times in the last year uh, to promote that, the, the whole Sakali at home. And uh, we had some, we actually, she hosted uh, six or seven live sessions during the event and simulcast them onto her channel as well. Um, but Sarah, I, ha I do have to run. Um, so right, thanks great. everybody. Thanks, Justin. Yeah, thank you. I think you wrapped that up. And then Anna, I just wanted to touch really quick on that question you had about what platform would you recommend for a free event that has a limited marketing budget, a virtual banquet for a nonprofit? So um, if you are still here and in the chat, feel free to answer and give me a little bit more detail. I was asking, could you tell me a little bit more about the event and how it's going to be set up? But again, for me, I'm always going to be looking at my two favorite tools, which are pretty affordable and um, there's a lot of nonprofit options, which are Zoom and GoToMeeting. And, you know, if you're looking to bring people into a space uh, to all spend time together, you want to be able to see them on screen and interact with them. You want to be able to do breakout sessions and things like that where they can interact in small groups and do different things. Those are the tools that I'm using right now because I think there's just a low entry point. And of course, there's a lot of alternatives to Zoom and GoToMeeting that you can look at. BlueJeans has a number of options, which I mentioned earlier. Um, there's things like Join Me. Uh, and to me, it's just about comparing the prices and looking specifically for nonprofit discounts. Because in 2020, they've actually opened up a ton of nonprofit pricing on all of these platforms. So, you know, to me, that's why Zoom has been kind of a go-to for my smaller classes that are, let's say, 100 people or less, because then I can bring them into that space. I can get them to go into small groups and meet each other, but we can have larger groups. I can see them on screen. I can unmute them so that they can talk to me. And it's much more sort of interactive as if we're in a room together than when we're doing something that's more webinar style like this. So, um, yeah, so I hope that's helpful. But again, thanks to everyone who's stayed uh, for the wrap up. I know that was a lot of questions, but I'm really glad that we've been able to um, hopefully give you some insights based on our experience. Yeah, and Anna, I see your comment. You've got a thank you banquet for your donors um, as you conclude the capital campaign. So it's videos, possible live music, and a keynote speaker. So again, I am going to throw out, I love Zoom for that because you can bring in you know, multiple uh, co-hosts into your space. So the people playing music can be somewhere and they can come on screen when you need them. The keynote speaker can come on screen when you need them. You can have somebody that is the moderator that turns their um, video and audio on and off. Um, and they may be coming in between each act um, and things like that. So I think, you know, again, very comparable to Zoom is go to meeting and some of the other tools. And I would just find out who can give you the best nonprofit discount overall. Yeah, and so Zoom has obviously two tools, webinars and meetings. And so that's where I think webinars are great, but they're very limited when it comes to actually interactivity, whereas the meetings are much stronger. But again, thank you all so much for joining us and for all the great questions. If you have any other questions when you get a download of my slides, you can reach out and contact me directly anytime. I'm glad to offer any insight I can. Also, our next free monthly digital drop-in will be Wednesday, December 2nd, and Justin and his JB Media Group agency team are gonna be taking the reins in December and presenting some amazing information about artificial intelligence and content marketing. And then for those of you who are interested in tourism marketing, we have an excellent upcoming event in November called Rebound in 2021 through Tourism Marketing. It's a two-day workshop intensive with a lot of great instructors, and I'm really, really exciting. 
And then Ruthie, I see your question. What do you think about recording the keynote talk and having them there to answer questions and interact? So I assume what you're saying is having the keynote pre-recorded, letting them watch that, and then creating a session where they get to come and speak to the keynote speaker. Is that what you mean? I just want to clarify. If so, I think that's entirely doable. Um, I think one of the things that you, know, you may want to think about to incentivize engagement is you know, can you have the keynote talk available for a certain amount of time so that people are incentivized to really watch it right before they get to the live uh, sort of event or live interaction, right? Um, because I do think sometimes, you know, when you separate those things, right, when you have something pre-recorded and then they go live, it's kind of a situation where some people might watch the video and then not show up for the live event or they might not watch the video and show up for the live event. So you may, if you, those things need to be really connected, then you might wanna make sure that you say, hey, the keynote talk is up, it's available for 72 hours, please watch it and then join us for our live Q&A with the speaker this day at this time. Um, but I do think you know one of the positives of having it all together in live is really having that keynote person, which hopefully has a reputation and they are a draw to people and then really giving people access to that person after the fact. So one of the things I've been doing with some of my keynotes is, you know, doing an hour of a talk and then having 30 minutes to really interact with the attendees and answer their questions right there in the moment. So I think it would be a discussion with the speaker about what they prefer. Um, I think certainly either one could be accomplished, but like I said, I feel like you'd want to have some type of schedule, some type of clear kind of um, steps for people so that they don't drop off on one of those things, right? Because it's hard on a keynote speaker if you have a live event and nobody shows up to ask questions, um, or if they do show up and they haven't really watched the keynote, they're not really prepared to ask relevant questions. So you would just want to figure that out. Yeah, and Jay, I see your comment. I've been on multiple panel talks in recent months where folks misunderstood, but they were supposed to have watched the documentary or whatever ahead of time. So yeah, exactly, you're nailing it. Like I've had that same issue um, where again, there's not as much interactivity if it wasn't really clear with people. So sometimes saying the keynote is only available to watch this amount of time, please watch it today and then you'll be attending this, you know, the next day or at the end of the week um, and really kind of, you know, giving them some sort of structure. Uh, Cause otherwise, like I said, I think some of that, uh, the, the fuzziness that we're all getting about being virtual so much, a lot of times we'll forget unless we have really clear calendar invites that we can plug in. That's another thing, Ruthie, I would really suggest when you do things separate like that, have calendar invites when you at, when people sign up so that they can just add it directly to their calendar in the click of a button. That's really gonna help them um, be accountable for that piece. So again, thank you everyone so much for being here. As usual, it's love to, lovely to see you. We will send out, like I said, um, the recording along with the slides tomorrow. And if there's anything I can help you with, don't hesitate to reach out. Have a great rest of your day. And I hope to see you at our next digital drop-in.